The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. Talk Station, Faith Matters. Good morning, and welcome to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. My name is Carl Zorowski. I am the pastor at St. Peter's United Methodist Church, and I'm here this morning with Blake Larson from Liberty Church in Havelock. And Blake has got some interesting stories he's going to share with us today, because Blake has just gotten back from the revival that everybody has been hearing and reading about up at Asbury. Blake? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because in a different time and place, I don't feel like it'd be a big deal for somebody to say, oh, you were in Kentucky? Tell me about that. But I got to tell you, it was really something interesting. It was somewhat of a spontaneous decision because I really enjoy planning, but you can't really plan for God. And so after Sunday service, one week ago today, was just praying about it, talking about uh, this with my pastor, who's now retired, but will always be my pastor. Even when he's dead, I'll still call him and ask him for advice. And he said that one of the greatest memories he ever had with his staff was attending the revival that was happening in Toronto some years back, the Blessing uh, Revival, and how it was just so unifying. and, And so I called up the key leaders and ministers at my church, and four of us took off on Monday. And we attended the revival on Tuesday and on Wednesday and came back on Thursday about mid-afternoon and I slept for about a day. It was something I'm really glad that I went to. I wish I could tell you that every piece of it was amazing and holy and God-driven. And I can only tell you that most of it was. It's a genuine move of God that's been happening there. And of course, this past Thursday was their last scheduled service. And it would, it would seem that they're trying to empower the, the outlying ministries to go and take this and spread it. There are other, there's talks of other campuses and colleges and churches where things are happening, such as Cedarville University in Ohio and, and stuff like that. So they're going to be going to an actual like arena, but this is not Asbury College that's putting that on. It's just different ministries that are trying to take that fire and run with it. But one thing that I noticed is Asbury very rarely uses the word revival. Now that's become a hashtag That's become the talking point, but Asbury is referring to it as an outpouring from the Lord, Mm -hmm. which is pretty wise in my view, because the word revival is not really used in the Bible, not in the way that we would, that we would call a revival, a revival today. And so it's just an outpouring. One of the things that, that we noticed, especially on the first night that we attended, the first night that we attended, we went to an overflow chapel across the street from Asbury. And when I say that, I mean walking distance across the street from the Hughes Auditorium. We were in a place called the Estes Chapel, and that's actually by Asbury Seminary. They're not the same school, but they're, they're, they're friendly with one another. And we watched the revival on the screens there, but we still you know, got personal prayer. I walked up to somebody and had them specifically speak into the issues that I deal with. And what was so interesting about this is it's a revival for sure, but it's a revival of humility and repentance. You've seen a lot of people say, this is a great revival because there's not even any celebrity preachers. There's not even real worship teams and there's not even smoke and lights and haze. And to be honest with you, I get a little annoyed when people say stuff like that because you're assuming that God can't show up in an atmosphere that has smoke or haze or lights or a celebrity preacher either. You should be aware that we serve a God who can... He can show up anywhere at any time. What was more telling to me is we didn't even get to hear their names most of the time. So what I mean by that is you would have somebody come up for a 30-minute message, and they would say, this is Sarah, or something Mm -hmm. like that. But when they would say, hey, do you have a life verse? Do you have a verse that the Lord has spoken to you? We're going to have you come up here and just speak the word of God. We're going to listen to it, and and we're going to say, this is the word of God. I believe it. And we would say that together. And these kids would come up, these college kids. They wouldn't say, now, what's your name? Where'd you come from? How far did you travel? No, just somebody would come up and they would say, blah, 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 from Galatians 5, 6 or something. And they would say, this is the word of God. One of the things that was interesting is they really, really encouraged you, go find somebody and confess your sins to one another. Now, obviously, especially in the Catholic tradition, we confess to you know priests or things like that. But for most in a Protestant nature, 
we look at that scripture and we see it says, confess your sins to one another. And it talks about healing following that. And so they just talked about how we really are designed to have the transparency to be humble enough to say, hey, I've served the Lord for 40 years and I struggle with porn. Or to say, I've, I've served the Lord my whole life and I really am a jealous person. And to confess your sins to one another. And what was mind-blowing was to find how many Christians were struggling with things that they were afraid to talk about it. And so it was really earmarked by radical humility because it really does take humility to walk up to a stranger and say, hey, here's one of my secrets. So you sensed that there was a lot of humility mm-hmm. in, the, in the crowd. There. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was, it, was there a particular age demographic that seemed to be represented more or less there? I mean, were there gray-headed people like me there, or were they all <laughs> young hipsters like you? Oh, well, God bless you for calling me a young hipster. I celebrated my 40th birthday while I was there. I was in the glorious in-between. And I celebrated my <laughs> 63rd the day you were leaving to go. <laughs> That's so. true. Uh, February is just the best month to have a birthday. I it think is, is the takeaway. Is. Thanks for listening this morning. Honestly, by the time I got there, it was a mixture. By the time I got there, it was the end of the two-week mark of, of things happening. This started with 19 students in a chapel service mm-hmm. and just kept going for a while. It was almost 24 hours a day that they would swap in and out. I heard somebody remark on how they thought it was powerful because it was low-budget production, and I would argue that and say it was a no-budget production. <laughs> no-budget. Mm-hmm. No, there was a lot there that were younger, but at this point, people from... India, people from the UK, people from South America were coming. And they tried to relegate Hughes Chapel primarily or Hughes Auditorium primarily for the younger ones, but they did allow us in on the second night. I would suppose that part of that was because one of my staff members was younger than 25, and so we just got grandfathered in quite literally with her. And I would say there was, there was a wide variety of not just denominations, spiritual backgrounds, but ages. What I did see towards the end, and this is why I say it's mostly spiritual, by the end, you always have somebody who's coming for the spectacle. I believe that the presence of God fell in Asbury because you just had people that were hungry for God. And so for people at Liberty or perhaps at your church or other churches that say, we'd like to have this happen too, I would just say, you're going to have to be hungry like they were hungry. Right. You, can't, you cannot yeah. plan for an event like this Mm-mm. to occur. No, you, you no. certainly can't. But if you are open to God's leading, mm-hmm. then certainly um, God can make something yeah. like this happen. Yeah. Looking back at this, at your time up there, would you refer to this as one of the mountaintop experiences of your life spiritually? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. it's just something different. Uh, you've, you've probably been to conferences like I have, you know, that are filled with Christians, and they do have speakers and plans and breakout sessions and boxed lunches from oh, Chick-fil-A, because yes. that's yes. the Lord's chicken, and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And those are fine, and I'll probably go to some in the future. But this was just an organic gathering of people who would have never known each other otherwise, but they just wanted to come and get a touch from the Lord. It makes me think of the woman with the issue of bleeding, and she races out to touch the hem of Jesus's garment. She was just willing to do what it took to get there. Right. And and when she did that, she crossed all types of, mm-hmm. of boundaries and, mm-hmm. and lines that wouldn't normally be crossed. Did you feel like all boundaries came down in that place? Pretty much. Uh, Yeah, I mean, nobody, you know, I mean, we would move if somebody was uh, getting real, um, I guess what I'll say, bouncy with worship. If they were were spinning a little bit much, we would just kind of move away from them. But some people were very demonstratively dancing and worshiping, and some are just uh, standing there in their spot. What I will say is on the second night, we saw a crew that obviously had come from a similar place, and they were now taking videos. And to be honest with you, I felt like the Lord told me not to take videos while I was there. Um, Mm -hmm. As we were exiting, I took one video from the back just of people singing How Great Is Our God, just so I could show my wife. But I posted pictures that we were there. I did not post pictures of the revival because it was just a holy moment. That's not what it was for. But I saw some people taking videos, not even of what was happening or other people, but with the camera faced towards them, like a group of four or five people. And they're just singing the worship songs into the camera with their arms around each other. And it felt like a concert moment there. And uh, I talked about that with my leaders too. And I think it's a good reminder, probably a good way to end this segment is to talk about this. God has holy moments and moves and not just amongst people, but amongst persons. And I think sometimes we can get so excited that the movement of God is happening or the presence of God is here 
that all of a sudden it becomes a spectacle and it becomes more about, hey, I was there. Hey, this happened. Right, right. And it's not meant to be about you, not in this move of radical humility. It's supposed to be about God impressing upon you things to change. Repentance is not just being sorry about the mistakes in your life or the sins you've committed. It's about making a 180. It's about turning from them. And it takes some real guts to do that. You talk about the difference between um, like worship and a concert or, you know, the concert moment. You, you look at someone and you say, okay, where is their focus? Is their focus on God or is their focus on themselves? Yeah. Now, the four that were gathered and singing, what exactly was going on with them? I don't know. Sure. You don't know. We don't know what was in their heart. God knows what's in their heart. Yep. And I'm, I'm just really glad that you were able to go and experience that for yourself. And I thank you for coming and sharing that with all of us this morning here on Faith Matters. We will be right back. Good morning. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. This is a program where we like to discuss current events through the lens of faith. And uh, thank you for tuning in this morning. Hopefully you're on your way to your own church service or on your way back from one. My name is Pastor Blake Larson from Liberty Church in Havelock. And I'm joined by my good friend, uh, Pastor Carl Zorowski from St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. And he's got our next article for us. And this article kind of comes on the uh, comes on the tail of our discussion in the first segment mm-hmm. about the Asbury Revival. This article comes from the Christian Post. It's written by Wallace Henley. It's entitled, Has the Lightning of Revival Struck in the United States? Revival happened in Wales in 1904 to 1905, beginning with youth. Is it happening now in the United States? In Wales, Evan Roberts, a coal miner barely out of his teens, had been struck by the lightning, and everyone with whom he came into contact was ignited. I will never forget the lightning in his voice, said Alan Morgan, an older man who was in contact with Evan in those days. When the revival vault hit Evan Roberts, a church leader described him as, quote, acting like an article of radium, a consuming fire which took away sleep, cleared the channels of tears, and sped the wheel of prayer throughout this district, unquote. It happened to Evan during a prayer service on September 29, 1904. During that session, Evan began to sense an irresistible influence coming upon him as he last listened to Pastor Seth Lloyd pray for God to, quote, bend me, unquote. In a short time, the humble youth, a gangly former coal miner and blacksmith, would be regarded as the leader of the revival. Meanwhile, the lightning of revival had struck a teenage girl in a Calvinist chapel in West Wales. A historian described Flory Evans as one of the highly significant figures in the revival. During a church service, the pastor asked people to answer the question, what does Jesus mean to you? Flory, a new believer, could not be silent. She declared, I love Jesus with all my heart. With that, conviction spread audibly and tangibly throughout the room. From those beginnings, a powerful revival began to spread throughout the country, and it was much needed. Churches had gone cold, and attendance had declined. Immorality and drunkenness were corrupting the society, destroying families, and wrenching the beauty and life from Wales, which had been known as a land of inspiring worship music sung by mighty Choirs. Well, you know, Blake, it sounds to me like the situation in Wales was not that different than the situation mm-hmm. here in our country today. You know, and the, and the writer goes on to ask, is revival on the horizon for us? We need to join in spirit and soul, at least their worship and intercession. It's either revival or unraveling. Mm, that's good. It's like I've heard it described before. There's a deconstructionist movement about breaking down what what you were taught was of God as a child. And I've always heard that that's okay as long as you're a reconstructionist too. It's okay to try to separate what you absorb that is of people so that you can grab a hold of what is God. 
Yeah, it's the same. I would say the big change from then to now <laughs> is social media. That's right. They didn't have social media in, in Wales. No, back I, at the I, I, suppose the, I suppose that would have been the 20th century. some papers uh, dispersed now and then. But social media now, it, it, it can make it a little bit of a spectacle. But what, what was so encouraging is in both of these is you have a hunger for God and people who say, you know what, I need a touch. Revival is an interesting word because it implies that you need to be revived. It right. implies that there is maybe a dip in the spiritual life. And we have certainly seen criticisms of Christianity or of faith in general throughout the years. And it's sort of like the Lord is saying, okay, this is a great time for revival. But it's important to know that it's not resuscitation. It's not that faith is dead. It's a revival where it becomes real to you. There's a lot of people that are fine going to the church and fine knowing that there is one God and they believe it's Jesus. But for somebody to stand up in front of people and say, I love Jesus with all my heart, you don't hear that as often nowadays. No, and that, and that takes great humility mm-hmm. to do that. You know, like you were talking earlier about the humility you saw on display up at Asbury. For Ash Wednesday this past week, I preached on a passage from the prophet Joel mm. where God says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill, let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming a day of darkness and gloom. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. True revival, a true awakening happens from the heart. It happens deep within. It's not that I am feeling guilty because I haven't been coming to church enough or I feel guilty because I'm looking at Facebook while I should be listening to the sermon. Although as the pastor, I hope I'm not on Facebook during this. <laughs> Actually, I hope nobody's on Facebook during the sermon. But you know, it's not about doing the right thing. It's about getting our heart right with God. And only Jesus can get our heart right with God. The change has to happen within. Oh, yeah. yeah. You have to play part in it. Why God chooses to do his move through broken people, I won't ever understand on this earth, but he does. Mm-hmm. And that means we have to play a part in it. Were you, were you quoting from Joel chapter 2? Yes, I was. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, yeah, this very morning we're discussing this at Liberty as well, but we'll discuss it more in depth next week. But this, this was actually a prophetic word that one of my leaders received, a 20-year-old that we have on staff who's doing an incredible job leading our children. And also in that same chapter, it says, after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on servants, men and women alike. And then it goes on to say, I'll cause wonders in the heavens and the earth, these miraculous signs about it. And we spend so much time looking for those signs, don't we? To try to see like, well, is this really what God is doing? That we forget that he's trying to give the old men dreams and the young men visions that men and women are called to prophesy and Mm -hmm. and to speak about the Lord. And so, so for real revival, it has to be you wanting to do it too. Doctors can do all that they can in a hospital, but you also have to have a will to live. And you have to will to, to heal. And a lot of times when people give up hope, that's when we know they go downhill. It's the same thing spiritually. You're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And, and you were talking about that passage from Joel where it talks about, I will pour out my mm-hmm. spirit. You were talking earlier about um, Asbury being this outpouring of the spirit yes. more than a revival. revival. John Wesley taught that corporate worship was a means of grace. Yeah. It's one of the ways that God's love is poured down from heaven into us and out through us to others. And certainly we see that in a, in a spirit of revival. I wonder sometimes, Blake, if we don't miss these signs that we're looking for because we're too busy looking for what we expect yep. that we overlook what we're actually presented. Oh, I think you're onto something there, Carl. It's it's ju- it's no different than the Pharisees when Jesus showed up and they're waiting for this king to show up and to free them from the Romans and to set up shop and be basically the best thing since King David. He's even better than King David. Uh, but he showed up riding a donkey and <laughs> they just looked at him and thought, this isn't how we thought it was going to go. And they could not, they could not wrap their minds around it. They just couldn't. Right, right. You're right. They couldn't. The uh, revival in 
Asbury, I like to I'd like to think of it more like an awakening mm. than a revival. Yes. Again, going back to Wesley, but I am a Methodist. Uh, <laughs> he talked about repentance not so much as being a turning around, but an awakening. We awaken to the fact that we need to change. We awaken to the fact that we're separated from God. Yeah. And I think that when we see this outpouring of the Spirit, we are seeing all of these young people experiencing this awakening. Yeah. And our nation has had several um, events that we could refer to as great awakenings. There was George Whitfield that spread the gospel mm -hmm. in the 1700s. There was another second great awakening in the late 18th century in the Midwest. Um, there was a third great awakening in the 1850s where the YMCA played a great role. And then finally, you had the fourth great awakening in the 60s and 70s, which included what's uh, referred to as the Jesus movement yep. that we're going to be talking about in our next segment today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so it's it, And this could be another great awakening for yeah. our nation. I hope it is. Oh, I do, too. There's there's uh, any number of smaller, I mean, if you want to call them smaller revivals that happen. Of course, I've been reading a lot about this. I actually purchased a, a book on my Kindle while I was out there called The Radical Wesley. I'm excited to read oh. about some of John Wesley uh, myself, but um, but even people forget this. But even during the Civil War, there was what is known as a revival, and it happened amongst the North and the South as the as the war was ending. So God uses even those darker things, and so yeah, an outpouring. Um, but you've got to be ready to catch some of this. You've got to be ready to jump in and do your part, and you've got to be open and not be so so cynical. I think God can defend Himself if it's not of Him, and you have to be willing. To change. Yes. You have yes. to be willing to change. That's repentance. That's, that's key. That is key. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening. We'll be back right after these messages. back to our third segment on this morning's edition of Faith Matters. Blake, you've got an article you're going to share with us now about Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California. Absolutely. This article comes from Religion News Service, and it is, uh, it's an article written by Adele Banks. It says, Southern Baptists oust Rick Warren's Saddleback Church for naming a female pastor. It says, Saddleback Church, the megachurch long led by Rick Warren, has been ousted from the Southern Baptist Convention for naming a woman to its pastoral team against the Southern Baptist Convention, or SBC, teaching. The SBC's executive committee decided on Tuesday, February 21st, to approve the recommendation from the denomination's credentials committee that the Lake Forest, California church, quote, be deemed not in friendly cooperation with the convention on the basis that the church has a faith and practice that does not closely identify with the convention's adopted statement of faith, as demonstrated by the church having a female teaching pastor functioning in the office of pastor, unquote. Stacy Wood, the wife of Andy Wood, who replaced Rick Warren as the lead pastor last summer, has the title of teaching pastor. Saddleback was one of five churches that were declared to no longer be in friendly cooperation because of a woman having a pastoral role. One church, Freedom Church in Vero Beach, Florida, was ousted, quote, based on a lack of intent to cooperate in resolving concerns regarding a sexual abuse allegation, unquote, the executive committee stated, which, by the way, my own thoughts seems like a much bigger deal. Um, yes, yes, I, I agree. Um, we're, we're not comparing apples yeah, and oranges. Not here. at all. Executive committee member Mike Keybone tweeted that any of the churches that were ousted Tuesday have the option of appealing to the messengers or delegates in attendance at the SBC's next annual meeting, which is scheduled for June in New Orleans. And so an Oklahoma pastor tweeted, Saddleback now has the option to appeal, which appears likely. Now, Rick Warren, Saddleback's founding pastor, made a surprise visit to the 2022 SBC annual meeting and urged Southern Baptists to overcome their differences and continue to cooperate. Here's his quote. He says, I love Southern Baptists. As Western culture becomes more dark, more evil, more secular, we have to decide, are we going to treat each other as allies or not? Uh, as of now, Rick Warren has declined to comment uh, about the executive committee's decision 
But Saddleback's elders issued a statement late Tuesday that echoed his earlier comments. Uh, by, by his, I mean Rick Warren. And this is what they had to say. They said, we love and have always valued our relationship with the SBC and its faithful churches. We will engage and respond through the proper channels at the appropriate time in hopes to serve other like-minded Bible-believing SBC churches. Meanwhile, we remain focused on following God's leadership to love and serve our church, uh, church family, and the communities around our campuses. Now, Carl, that's a statement that doesn't say a whole lot. But it does address the issue where they, it does sound like they're going to appeal this decision to remain in there. But it does also say, but guys, can't we all get along on this? Sure. And I, I wonder how many times God looks down every day at the church, mm-hmm. capital C, and says, why can't you guys just get along? Yeah. Why can't you get along? You know, we, we've been talking on the show in weeks past about some of the division in the um, United Methodist Church mm-hmm. and the formation of a new denomination called the Global Methodist Church. And we have churches that have split down the middle. We ha- I have colleagues in the ministry that I have been very connected to for years that now suddenly we've gone on two different paths and we're in different denominations. And God's plan for the world, for the church, was not division. God's plan for the for the church was harmony, for God's people to be, li- be able to live in harmony with one another as the body of Christ. The issue of female pastors, well, in the, in the Methodist church, it's a non-issue yep. because certainly in the Methodist church, women are ordained clergy, men are ordained clergy. Yeah. I don't think that it's my place if somebody were to come to me, whether they be a man or a woman, come to me and say, well, I feel like God has spoken to me and placed this call upon my heart to enter into the ministry. Who am I to say, yes, that happened to you, or no, that didn't happen to you, or no, you're not worthy to have that happen to you? Yeah. So, you know, for me, the, the issue of women pastors is, is, like I said, it's kind of a non-issue. And when people want to talk about whether or not women can be clergy— I always remind them, who was the first person to ever declare Jesus is raised from the dead? Who was it? Was it one of the 12 disciples? No, it wasn't. It was a woman. You know, that's kind of what our preaching is supposed to be, is declaring that he's risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it sounds like she was preaching there. Full disclosure, at Liberty, we, we do recognize women as ordained pastors. I'll actually be ordaining two women in October of this year after years of study and service and, and seeing and recognizing the call in their lives. I just think, for me, when you read through the scriptures, to be fair to this subject, it's muddy. It does not say men and women can. It does not not say that. There are scriptures from Paul that are difficult to read when it says, I declare that they should stay silent in church. And it's just interesting because if that's really, if our takeaway is that they can't be ministers, this is what's always been a sticking point for me. Then do you adhere to everything else that he says about the church services and how women should be? Do you adhere to who is allowed to have a head covering and who is not? Do you adhere to whether or not they're allowed to have jewelry? Do you adhere to them being completely silent? And when it says that they can't have authority over a male, which by the way, those words are interchangeable. They can also be used to say husband or wife. So that that scripture could be translated as, I do not permit a wife to have authority over her husband. But that's we don't have time to dive into that. When it says that, are you allowing women to teach your male children in kids' church? And mm-hmm. at what point are they not allowed to teach anymore? Is it when they turn 13, the Jewish age of accountability, which is also not in the Bible? Or is it when they turn 18, according to the government, when we say that they're a man and not a boy? And so it's just a hard thing to look at. And because it's muddy, this is my point. Why divide over it? Because if somebody doesn't want to attend a church where women could be a pastor, there are certainly options. There are certainly options. Right. One of their options is don't attend that church. Correct. Go to another church. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't know if that means you have to... One of the words that I've read in other articles about this is that Saddleback Church has been disfellowshipped. And that word is heartbreaking to me. Say that again? That they have been disfellowshipped. They have been disfellowshipped. That's a horrible term. Right. Because we're called to be in fellowship with one another. And the Bible says that the world is going to know that Jesus is real and that he lives. How? Because of our great love for one another. And when you read that in context, I'm sure you know this as well as I do. 
He is not talking about just being humanistic or loving people. He's speaking to believers that an unbelieving world will know that he's real because of the way that believers love one another. Right, right. And, and so often people look at the church and just shake their head because they say, look at them. They can't even get along sure. with one another. They don't even love one another. Why should we be listening to them on how we are to love yeah. one another? I totally agree. And, and the idea about that is why would they feel like there's anything attractive to the faith if they look and we're meaner to each other than they are on the outside of the church? And of course, there's a lot that's been going on. There's division over the revival in Asbury, which we talked about earlier this morning. Um, the Methodist church, which you referred to, is going through some things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just think it's time for us to really try to come together and, and unite, but we'll unite around the things that do unite us that we can agree on, and that is Christ, Christ crucified, and Christ resurrected. I know I have known many female pastors. I've known many male pastors. I've known some great female pastors. I've known some not so great right. on both female and male. But like I said earlier, I believe that when God wants to speak through someone, I cannot be there to stand in that person's way Sure, to try to silence God's word as it's going to come. And I think a lot of times, um, uh, you know, a woman is going to approach something with a different perspective than a man will. They're going to look at a situation in a different context than a man will. And, And God may be able to present a better message for a particular place and time Certainly. through a particular person. Yeah. In the same way that an African-American uh, has different life experiences than a Caucasian person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and by the way, Methodists have a different perspective maybe than a non-denominational or a Baptist, which is why we have this program is so that we can come together over what unites us. Well, actually, I'd like to think that the Methodists have the proper one and that one day you're going to see. I mean, you did you did tell me, I don't know if it was on air or off air, that you had just bought a book. You just bought a book about Wesley, so we're, we're working on it. We'll you. see. We're we'll see you. what I find out in that book. Well, John Wesley, um, he also was not a fan of female clergy yeah. and was um, not interested in ordaining any. But then as time went by, he began to see that there were some women within the church that had great Mm -hmm. gifts. Mm -hmm. And so he gave them the authority to preach. And that was seen as very controversial, very radical. But if someone someone has a gift, you need to share it. It's seen as controversial. But do you know what? That is one of the, the things that I think every Christian needs is to remember to be teachable. And that's part of that radical humility at the Asbury um, outpouring and revival and all of that too. Just be humble enough to be teachable because God is going to come in ways that you wouldn't always suspect. And, uh, and as much as I hold to my doctrines that I believe, I also hold to the fact that I will have my theology corrected when I step into glory one day. I think we all will. And I'm okay with that. But to the best of my knowledge while I'm here, I'm going to remain open and teachable to the Lord, and I'm going to remain united with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And hopefully, you are going to see your brothers and sisters in Christ this morning or have already been to your church service. We hope that you do that. And we've got one more segment here on Faith Matters, so I hope that you'll stick around for it. If you're familiar with something that was known as the Jesus Movement, we're going to touch on that subject and something that's right out there for the world to see in, uh, in just a few minutes right after this. Thanks for tuning in and listening to uh, Faith Matters right here on the talk station. and welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station. This is our final segment of the morning, and I'm I'm joined here with my good friend, Pastor Carl Zorowski from St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. My name is Blake Larson. I'm the lead pastor at Liberty Church. Now, we've got one final subject we're talking about this morning. We're going to head to the movies. This article comes from Fox News, and it's written by Tracy Wright and Larry Fink. The article is entitled, Frasier star Kelsey Grammer says religion guides his career. 
Kelsey Grammer's career focus has been to, quote, elevate the human experience, unquote, which is similar to his religious beliefs. Grammer portrayed pompous psychiatrist Dr. Fraser Crane for decades, first starring on Cheers and then receiving his own spinoff called Fraser. The complicated character, who provided talk therapy on his radio show, earned Grammer multiple Emmy Awards and Golden Globes until the sitcom was canceled in 2004. His new role as Pastor Chuck Smith in the movie Jesus Revolution hit home for a myriad of reasons, but mainly Grammer's own connection to religion. Grammer said, It strikes me, you know, I probably have been preparing for this role my whole life, honestly. It was a pretty seamless transition into playing Chuck. I'm kind of a Bible guy. I've been reading the Bible all my life. I turn to it for prayer, for reflection, for information. And I just always have. It's just always been sort of at my fingertips throughout my life ever since I was a boy. He added, So I have a relationship with the Word of God, as they call it, that it was probably akin to what Chuck Smith's relation was with it. Based on a true story, Pastor Chuck makes friends with a hippie preacher, making waves in the 70s counterculture movement, much to the dismay of his aging congregation. Grammer said, I lived it. I lived throughout that period in the 70s and stuff and what he accomplished. I saw on some of the faces that I met in my life. I didn't know it was, you know, his footsteps, but I was walking alongside him in many things. When this role came along, it was just like slipping into a nice suit. He hoped audiences would be able to receive a few messages from the movie. There might be something to it, he said. Might be something to this movement that happened then, and maybe it's worthwhile to think about. The way we're positioned in terms of faith and society, a great society can embrace a great faith and probably enhance both. That's what I'd like to see happen. Grammer noted that he was raised a Christian scientist and paraphrased the passage, do not become a sluggard in the race. Don't falter. Get back up. Stand up. Keep fighting because that's where your reward is. Your reward is in the doing of it. Do not be weary. That's it. That's why I still believe that. It's an interesting article here about the star of this movie that so many of us will remember him from his time on uh, television. Oh, and by the way, the film Jesus Revolution, I believe, opened on Fridays. I'm not sure if it's playing around here, but that's one of those films I'm planning to go see. But it's interesting reading this because he does talk about his faith. Yeah. He doesn't talk a lot about God. He talks some about Jesus, but really more as he was a good person, somebody to be emulated. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm seeing somebody here who has a great respect for the Bible, probably a relationship with the Bible, but I'm not sure how much I'm seeing a relationship with the one behind the Bible. To hear that he's raised Christian scientist, uh, you know, I I believe there are some core doctrinal issues that we would have um, that that we believe at Liberty Church and probably that y'all would believe uh, at the United Methodist Church as well, but... What is interesting is that he said he was raised Christian scientist, so I'm not sure if he still adheres to it. I'm not sure the direction he goes now, but there's a lot of talk about that movement, remembering how it went, remembering that he goes to the Bible for counsel and for inspiration. And here's the thing. The Bible is a great place to go for counsel and inspiration. You have no idea how much Christian faith has influenced society, how many sayings come from the Bible but that's because largely America is biblically illiterate in a lot of the stories. But it's already, it's interwoven in there. And so it's good that he's clinging to the word. But what you're saying is it would be so much better if he had a relationship with the one that is described as the word made flesh. And I, and I can't say that he doesn't. He sure. very well may. It just from what I read in the article, I'm not seeing that through the way he talks about it. He was once interviewed by Larry King, and he said, in my situation... Whatever set of things I was given as a child, I turned to a sense of faith that was kind of founded in an understanding of the absurdity of what goes on here, but supported by a belief in something bigger than myself. That's a real, that's a real 
word salad there, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, he, he says a lot right there. But but what I'm what I'm seeing here is more like he's got this belief system. He believes there's something that's there, but he's just not not really identifying what that something is. It could be God. It could be you know God in general terms. But he's not so much talking about a relationship with the Creator of the universe. Right. Well, and this is going to sound weird. I understand the Bible and its importance. I mean, you would think I need to. I'm a pastor. But the Bible in and of itself will not save you. The Bible is a collection of words and prophecies and life that show you to the one who calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. That's that's pretty, you know, all-encompassing. I mean, that's pretty much a totality uh, right there. Everything in the Old Testament points you to Jesus, and everything in the New Testament points you backwards to Jesus. Now, what I will say is the way that some people would describe Jesus is the way we, we should have a goal to describe ourselves. And what I mean by that is this. We're called Christians. We are little Christs. We're supposed to daily be conformed to the image of Christ. And so Jesus showed us how we could live it out, but he was able to show us that because he is the divine son of God. But a relationship with him, it makes you become like him. I've often heard this said, and I've, I've used this illustration In sermons before that we tend to become like a combination of the five people that we choose to spend our time with. Now that's key, that you choose to spend your time with. So for, sorry, a 15-year-old, you're forced to be around your parents. If you don't choose to be around your parents, it doesn't count as much. But when you choose to be around somebody, it's impossible not to absorb qualities of theirs because we, we are an influential people, both easily influenced and influencing of others, which is why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit in your life, which is why it's so important to be around Jesus because really the number one influence should be him. That kind of ties to what we were talking about earlier this morning, doesn't it, about repentance and radical humility and what it takes to say I was wrong in this area, but I'm changing because the Spirit of God is leading me? Yes, yes, it does, it does. This article also can tie in a little bit with with what we were talking about regarding the revival at Asbury, because Grammer's starring in this movie, you know, called The Jesus Revolution, And a whole lot of that had to do with worship looking very different. People were beginning to praise God with new kinds of music, and it made some people very uncomfortable. You know, what are these young people doing with our religion? Okay, And what they were doing was they were praising God. What were they doing up at Asbury? They were praising God. Some people might look at that and say, well, that's not what worship looks like, you know. But if it's coming from the heart, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. Sure. Yeah, all worship is is adoration and focus. And spoiler alert, if you're listening to this and you're a Christian, just know that you were made to worship. And if we don't worship God, we're going to worship something. The problem with that is then it becomes idolatry. But you are, you are called to pour out your adoration and place your focus upon the King of Kings, to have a relationship with God. A lot of people think the purposes of God are to save us, That's only one of the first steps. His goal is to be reconciled with you. The way that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden is the way he desires to walk with you. And so our God is not just a God of salvation. He is a God of reconciliation. But that takes relationship. It does take relationship. With the Jesus revolution, you know, a whole lot of that had to do with music. Okay, And you can reach people through Mm -hmm. music in ways that, that you may not otherwise be able to reach them. And I know at, at Liberty, I don't know what your worship style is at Liberty. I've never been to Liberty. Somehow I don't, I don't see Liberty as a, uh, as a church where you do a lot of Charles Wesley 17th century or 18th century. Only types. sometimes. Only sometimes. Only sometimes. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, you know, wherever it is that you choose to worship, I hope you're making plans right now to go to worship today and that you will open up your heart Because God is there waiting for you. God is there calling to you. Come to Him. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. To revisit today's program or to find more episodes, visit thetalkstation.com. 
is a production of The Talk Station.